Hey everybody, welcome back. It is Wes with Pikes Peak Trades and very excited to give you a comprehensive video update here on this Memorial Day weekend in the U.S. Uh, 2023. There's a lot for us to go over. It's been a while since I checked in with you. Uh, so I want to take you through everything I'm looking for. I want to take you through all the sectors. I want to take you through multiple time frames. Uh, I want to talk about uh, how we traded this week uh, at the PPT group. And um, I think we've got a lot of exciting things to look forward to. So I want to start as I have been for uh, many months, really, in these videos with the S&P 500 quarterly chart. And if, if you've been following and listening to me really since the middle of last year, I have talked about the importance of this 8 EMA on the SPX quarterly chart and how historically looking back through bear markets, when you get two consecutive quarters that lose that EMA without recovery, I'm, I'm pointing here and highlighting through the dot-com bust, through the early 2000s, and again here in the great financial crisis, this is when the bad of the bad of the bear markets set in. And so I had raised that alarm right here. Um, this, this would be the third quarter here that is ending 2022. And I had said, if we don't see recovery, at least something positive into the year end 2022, and then especially after that, that's when the bad of the bad sets in. And what I want to clearly show you, and I've been talking about this really since December of 2022, when I made the bottoming call that the bear market was done, this look here is not the same as these looks here. So we start with the highest time frame, most important charts. And I, I think at this point, if you're still holding out hope that your bearish uh, dreams are going to come true, I think you're really, uh, you're flying in the face of a weight of evidence that is not on your side from a historical, from a probability standpoint. Um, at this point, I think the only thing that uh, could possibly derail a brand new primary bull market leg is a black swan event. And, you know, we've got this this debt ceiling drama happening right now, uh, a U.S. default would be a once-in-a-lifetime generational black swan uh, event uh, that could change this. Uh, but, you, you know, and uh, I'm looking at the evidence in front of me, and I'm not speculating on what's going to happen over the next week or so uh, with politics. Um, the evidence right now says that um, the stock market's saying that's not going to happen. So I, I think... It is to your benefit, and I think it is to your benefit to prepare for the long haul on this. And that is certainly what I am choosing to do. And I'm not choosing to do it blindly. I am looking at this as from an evidence-based approach. And um, if chances are, if you're listening to this and watching this, uh, you've been with me for multiple months and been on board with that possibility. If you have not, and you are questioning uh, whether an ultra bearish thesis is true, I want you to just look at this objectively and look at this weight of evidence. And we start here again with that high time frame. This circled look is not like these two. Okay, we can go through the S&P and the Qs, uh, the NASDAQ on the high time frame charts, and we see healthy, healthy looks. We see here a hammer candle look. That's not coming off a low, but that is showing that through the end of May, that bulls are in control as they push price up into the end of the month. Uh, we can see the bull stacking EMAs, the eight over the 21, over the 34. That is a healthy bullish progression. And you can see my longer term count with a little more detail that I think uh, the COVID crash hit a cycle too low coming off a super cycle four in the GFC. And we are just in the early kickoff stages of a primary three of cycle three. Okay. Now that, that is the way that I am reading this from a market structure standpoint, um, I am not here to try to give you all the answers from a macro standpoint. That is not what I do. I will not pretend that I can put all the puzzle pieces together correctly uh, from um, all of the economics and all of the politics and all of that stuff. Um, I personally think 
if you try to, uh, you're, you're going to be paralyzed by your analysis. Um, and it's going to be really hard for you um, to rely on a set of information to make decisions. So looking at market pattern, looking at technicals, looking at market history, I think we need to be ready. And I think you should be looking more optimistically at what could be an incredibly bullish decade. Okay, getting down here into the SPX weekly, we're going to see again a healthy chart. So I, I had posted uh, weeks ago here, now it's almost two months ago, about the confirmed 13 over 34 EMA bull cross. That, again, you can go back and find that post on Twitter. That does not happen in a bear market. You can talk about the number of weeks that the S&P has been above after piercing back above a rising 200 week SMA. You can take the first 100 trading days of 2023 and talk about uh, the percent that the S&P is above and what that looks like in the future. And I honestly think the worst that you can find empirically uh, with this data from history is about a 10% chance that I'm wrong. And I personally think it's less than that. Uh, but again, we're going to see what happens this next week with some resolution. You can see into the details of my chart, and I think that we are still within a bullish progression of a minute three, of a minor three, of that first initiation kickoff impulse up. And so my projection is that I think we do see strength um, into maybe middle, end of June, and some rest as typically happens into the summer, uh, but I'm not saying we're going to make all-time highs this year. I don't think the S&P does. I think we'll probably have a little more of a rocky pullback maybe at some point um, in the fall, but I am projecting within this count that we eventually will, um, at some point in 2024, we will see new all-time highs on the S&P. Okay, we can look at the daily here. And so I can just start stacking these time frames for you. And, and you're going to notice, I'm going to jump over to SPY in a little bit. I've got two different counts right now on SPX versus SPY. And, and that's, that's really here just kind of me showing some flexibility and wanting to test a couple things from an internal count perspective. Either way, I think we are in, oops, didn't want to move that channel. We are in a three of three of minor three either way. And I wanted you to see on this daily chart how the S&P has just moved in to a very significant set of bearish gaps going all the way back here into the middle of August of last year. This was the highest daily and weekly close since those bear gaps really set us down on what I think was that final divergent selling leg in that part of our cyclical bear market. And the projection is going to be that this is the wave count to close them, that we will over the next few weeks, we will aggressively uh, close those, taking us into maybe some summer chop. We get into some degree fours, uh, which means that you're just going to need to be uh, be nimble and make sure that you are taking profits into strength. And we can talk about that on some small time frame charts here in a bit. Let me now get you into the SPY so you can see the difference in the counts. So it's actually a much more bullish um, intermediate count here instead of a one, two, three, four to then finish off only five waves into a deeper degree four. What if this is just a bullish one, two, one, two? And so I want to leave that on as a possibility um, in case we see a rotational move back into some of the laggard sectors of the S&P and the Qs slow down a little bit and the SPY, SPX picks up this kind of count that I think QQQ is already uh, much further in its progression. So that's kind of what I'm leaning towards right now is that uh, things like XLF, DIA, um, IWM, they start playing some catch up here. RK, let's put that in there as well. I'll take you through the details of some growth stuff. Um, so I, I honestly couldn't be more excited about the possibility of this. And I think keeping an open mind to, to this kind of outcome, 
I think is is the one that could bring about here uh, some really potentially life changing money opportunities in the market. We get into the small time frame, and so this will give you um, a look here at immediately what I'm looking for um, on Tuesday when markets reopen after the holiday. Also, want to talk about um, how we traded on Friday at, at PPT. So I had circled this area. Uh, this was Thursday post-market and Friday pre-market. And I had said, this 415 plus pivot is crucial. And what did we do? We just plowed right through it on Friday morning and then set in a consolidation in here that we were then able to buy aggressively. Uh, so I, you know, I, I didn't, uh, buy on the two minute candle or the five minute candle. You know, I kind of wish I would have, but that's just kind of a management plan that I put in place right off the market open. But we bought here aggressively and ran it all the way up into that next key pivot at 420, bought this dip returning through this FIB zone and, and exited a majority and had multiple winners on the day. I'll also talk you through some individual name calls uh, that I made. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll put that, that free Discord link um, in, in the description and bio of the video. It's in my bio on Twitter because there's just some really exciting opportunities coming on. So my view um, is that immediately on Tuesday that we are going to try to challenge this next open gap, which is just right above 422. How far we extend on there is anyone's guess. I think surprises in account like this are to the upside. If you disbelieve that, make sure that you go back and pay attention to the QQQ chart uh, because I got trolled pretty hard on uh, the bullish projections that I had within big tech. Um, and uh, uh, man, I buried those trolls. I, I really don't think they're going to be coming back for quite some time. So could we get this kind of surprising bullish move for uh, to finish May and then to start the next couple of weeks of June. This is my primary look. Now, uh, what what would take me out of that? Well, well, let me be clear on on how EW works within a nested um, immediate bullish extension count. Is you can see that I'm calling SPY a micro two within a micro three of three. What does that mean? That means that this wave four cannot trade back into the price high of wave one. So if we lose the Thursday afternoon high at 4.16.15, uh, then the count as you see labeled here is actually incorrect. That would likely mean that we probably do not break in that case the May 19 high. And I'll give you that alternate view now um, on ES. So let me take you through the ES 60 minute and what that would be. Let, and, and this is really, let's say that we just get a uh, horrible news about any debt resolution uh, over the weekend because this Friday, May 19 high did not break. If futures immediately open bearishly, then we have here, we have this uh, double zigzag count that would then result in kind of an impulse down. And, and this, this would be my bearish all that that could happen. And so if we see that immediately happening here in futures and we see futures lose this high, that's right there corresponding to that on the SPX. So this is at 4175.50. If we lose that immediately in futures on Monday into the Tuesday pre-market, then I think we need to be very, very aware uh, that, that markets have said they're unhappy with what's happening in the short term. And then we need to move into a more defensive and likely maybe a multi-day posture for some shorting. Okay, so wanted to make sure that I talked you through that alternative. Uh, but if if we solidly break through on the S&P and on futures, that May 19 high, we can then pull back in this four. And as long as this high right here, 416.15 isn't lost, I think dips are going to be viable going forward. Okay, now let's get into some other ones here. So let's look at the Qs and we look at the monthly Qs and 8% already on the month. We've got a few trading days left and, and, and this is a bearish chart. This is not a bearish chart. It just plowed through 
uh, the August 2022 highs, I think the S&P is going to follow suit um, in no time. It closed some significant gaps up here. And uh, when, when I said weeks ago that QQQ was going to be back at 350, we hit 349.25. Uh, just the uh, the amount of, of, of negative feedback that I got told me and, and just added to my conviction I, that I think I'm right. Okay. So um, right now you stare at this evidence and we've still got a monthly bull stack where nothing ever crossed bearishly. And we look down here at this divergence. I haven't talked much about that on monthly and weekly charts. That is super, super rare. And what an opportunity it was in December of 2022 to get ready for this. And if you've been with me, uh, I was, and I have been prepared and have, have reaped the benefits of it for certain. So where are we at here into the weekly again? Look at this bull stack. Look at that pointing up 60 degrees. That is not a bearish look at all. Now, are we overcooked here in the short term? Yeah. You get a weekly close outside of the upper BB and even just off of what has happened so far from uh, the bear market bottom, uh, we pulled back. We pulled back in February after that. We went sideways in the middle to end of April. So it is possible that we need some wave four rest that Qs and the S&P go through a little bit of, of wave four rest. It's also possible the Qs rest and the rest of the market rotates and that money gets back through the sectors that I already mentioned. So this was the next key gap for it to fill and that was the selling gap, not in August. It blew through those highs of 2022 all the way back into April. Okay. So, um, really just an incredible move. Once 322 went, look at that. We're up nearly $30 in big tech. Um, and, and my count says that there's more on the table. Let me get you more into the details of that. So where exactly are we now? It, it, it's a little bit up for interpretation on which degree four was set here on, on the weekly low on Wednesday. Um, and I have this right now showing it as a sub minute degree. And then we're working up here. Maybe we get a touch this week right here to the top diagonal and we get that 1.618 fib magnet. And then we can pull back and rest and get things back towards, let's say this rapidly increasing eight EMA. So if I take you into that small time frame now, let me get you out of that and into here. There we go. Okay, so where are we at? And this is a little bit of uncertainty here. This three could go here. This four could go here. And we could just run straight up here to that 353. I don't have the diagonal on there, but I really should as we're starting to approach it. And I think all of these dips are viable, just like all of these wave four dips were viable. Here's where I said, I don't think the Qs give back 330. It pierced it by 44 cents. I got trolled hard. And what happened? You bury the trolls with <laughs> a $20 move up. So I think dips are viable going forward. And like I mentioned with the SPY possible count, I think surprises are here potentially still to the upside. Because when I look at some individual names, I see something here like Amazon here on the short term. And what I see are fib zones within counts that are not yet finished. Okay. Maybe a name uh, like Microsoft and Meta, maybe those are, but I see work still on the table, all these gapping areas here on Amazon. I see a name like Tesla. Uh, came up just shy of the 1.618, kind of that key $200 psych level. And, and I think there's a little bit more here, even on the table for Tesla. I gave the call out here to my group on Friday morning. I said, get Tesla through 186 and get ready. We had some members that took advantage of that for just an outstanding trade in Tesla. And we can look at a name like Goog as well, that I think, again, there is upside resolution yet to occur. So uh, that tells me that, that the surprises could still be up. Um, I'm certainly not going to bet against what has happened, man, especially 
after what happened late to finish this week. Okay, now, uh, that's the really, really good news. That's everything that's looking just outstanding. Uh, we can kind of start to look at some things, uh, maybe some not so good news. And so we need to look at small caps. We'll try to keep things balanced here. And obviously, small caps, extremely laggard uh, here in the market. And this is not the monthly look that you see on the S&P and on the Q. So there is major work to be done uh, market-wide. And my suggestion would be that all of this here, this is accumulation. I already know uh, some pretty prominent and, and really pretty savvy money managers are starting to move to overweight in small caps because they're anticipating a catch-up move here. And really on IWM, we're kind of looking for here a key breakout area in the low 180s. And, and you've got here the 50 and 200 weeks stacked up against Price tried to wick up into it late in the week and, and just couldn't hold it here. And so conquering that is going to open up that next key pivot, which is that 200 psych level. And then from there, clear that. And, and that's what opens up new all-time highs here on small caps. Okay, within the details of the count, um, I've got a nested one, two. You're going to see that on Art K as well. That is the kind of count that you want to try to play. And let me just talk about this from a risk reward perspective. Your risk is from this close to this low. We're talking about three and a half dollars worth of risk. And what is your upside within this count? Your upside is moving up to those key pivots in the 190s to 200. Okay, so we're talking about 20 to the upside, three to the downside, and, and you take a, a risk reward of seven to one, and this is the kind of play uh, that, that I wanna be in. So I did swing some IWM, not huge. Um, it, it wasn't smart to put uh, a ton of money on the line from your account over into a holiday weekend with headline risk, but, uh, but enough catching a surprising move up is where I thought it was worth it to take a play. And so this is definitely high on my list here for active playing. Uh, gave out some alerts on this as well. It is in the kind of nested bull count that I think is worth your while. And then here again, you've got even on the small time, time frames, you've got a get out level where you know that this count's going to be violated. And that's why, you know, I love charting and projecting and trading with EW because the invalidation levels are so clear and it gives you your exit points so you exit quickly. You never want to be holding a loss long. You never want to get locked in to a, to a stubborn bias that's going to take a small loss into a big one. And that level is simply right here at about 175.50. Okay, others, other things that, that don't look great that need to shape up. But we have a little bit of shaping up here in the ARK-K weekly. And you can see these MAs starting to curl upwards. We got here we got the eight to cross the 21. Sorry, no, I, I read that number wrong. Seven cents away from the eight to cross the 21. It is curling and it's just stuck in there between the 821 cluster and it tried to pierce out and above of that 50 week, just couldn't do it. Uh, but I've got it in like IWM, a very similar count, a one, two nest where we're staring at these 40s and then a big, big breakout range at about 45. And that's what's going to unlock these higher wave three targets in the small time frame. So I had circled this key diagonal area, which really going back here was the top here of this weekly flag. And so circling that and we failed it on Thursday and that was a clue, you know, get out your lungs and, and growth are not going to stick and growth names needed to pull back. We punch through it Friday, pull back to it. Really interesting what's going to happen right in this $39, a bullish fib zone and this diagonal. And my suggestion would be if, if we don't get bad news and the market doesn't respond negatively is that there will be opportunities in growth. And so with that said, let me get in now to some of those growth names that I think are very, very tempting. And look at Roku. 
just perched right on this big time diagonal here that failed. It's already failed twice here and then an attempt here in early April and it tried it again here in May, punch back up. Are we gonna have fourth times the charm? So key on Roku, 60 bucks. Get above that and I think this opens up potentially very, very high for us. How about a name like Square? So Square hasn't quite set uh, maybe as promising a potential as Roku because of this deep, deep two. But do we have a one, two, one, two? Something to keep a look on. We've got shop over here. So taking a look at shop within this nested one, two, a one, two, three, four, looking for a push up into a minor three. And when I take you through some, um, some other bigger tech names, you're going to see that I think uh, we've reached minor three zones on a lot of names, but I think still some unfinished work to do. Again, let me talk about EW and validation is going to be the height of this minute one. So right there at 48.14, if shop loses it and you're a long holder, I think you want to exit because that means this immediate thesis for bullish continuation is then violated. Okay, we got Zoom. Now, uh, Zoom you, you can't ignore Zoom if you're an ARK follower because it's such a heavy weighted stock in here. And did we get just another divergent low opportunity uh, here at the, the end of April with a higher low opportunity? And then we've got just really, really good days here to finish the week on Zoom. It's pretty critical that a name like this gets going. I, I don't think it's in the position for me to actively hold or trade, but got to show you that to at least show you the potential of a key breakout area. And that's right around 68 on Zoom. Okay, um, wanna keep um, jumping back and forth here, but I wanna take you through some other sectors um, that definitely need to shape up. And we've gotta talk about financials uh, because you know we have the regional banking scare that really just ran financials down through February and March and, and caused a lot of uncertainty overall in the market. And we've got just another test and hold, I think, of the key 31 pivot that marked all the way back the high before COVID, a key breakout area. We've cut, sliced through it, recovered. We've done that three times and tested it again. And this really kind of needs to be the launch pad for banks to be able to get off the mat and move up and give that weighting in the S&P and IWM um, a little bit of fuel here. And that's really at about 34 for XLF. So we see that move up. We could really see a rapid move up here in the banks. And so we've got here, uh, again, you're gonna notice, I think it makes sense, like IWM, we've got that nested one, two, and this is anticipating a big breaking move um, into June above that 34 level. That's a multiple time frame resistance level. And that needs to be the place uh, that then sets off a key breakout up for the rest of the year. Let's take a look at DIA while we're here. Um, a name I like to trade, especially late in the week as you get closer to the Friday option expiry. Just a lot of back and forth in here pretty much throughout all of the year. Did we set a one, two, one, two? on DIA, that is my main count here. And then we're looking off of Thursday's 0.618 Fib low, we're looking for a pretty rapid recovery right back there to that key 340, 341 pivot. We may pull back and need to base under it one more time, but that is the breakout level that needs to be conquered with energy here on DIA. Okay, into the short term, so we look at that and I'm seeing a wave four triangle that's got upward work left to do. Um, and so again, you know, this is just a projection right into the start of the week. We'll see what that looks like in pre-market on Tuesday. Okay, that takes me through all of the main stock um, ETFs and indices. Let me actually get you through a couple more because I've got this NASDAQ chart here staring me in the face. And, and I had, had given this out way earlier in the year, about a one, two, one, two. And again, just received just a ton of hate on, on DMs and also just public comments on Twitter. And look at what we've done. 
look at just where we've gone. Now, comfortably in to this wave three zone, I, I challenge you to find uh, a, a better technician out there that, that has shown you this potential progression in the NASDAQ because it is just moving just like clockwork. Now, within this, we could have reached it and we pull back. And I've shown you that possibility already elsewhere. Surprises, though, could also be to the upside through this FIB zone. Uh, it's a wide zone here. Um, and that's really because of the strength of the move coming off this bottom here in the middle of March. And so we're going to, I'm excited to see, you know, it's tracked so well so far. We do know eventually there will be another way for, for pullback. It is possible that it's done. Let's again, just remind ourselves of the invalidation. It's of the same degree one. So it is at 12, 13, 99, about 12, 14. If that level breaks, that's when this count is violated. And then at that point, we, we, we need to be thinking more defensively. We need to be thinking that this actually could be um, that low probability uh, bear market move um, that actually probably coincides with, with a pretty surprising uh, event. Okay, so I wanted to also show you XLY uh, because I, I wanna talk about how this golden cross that occurred right here at the end of the week and, and just maybe a little bit of sentiment and a little bit of comparison by time period. Let's go back to the previous Golden Cross. We're talking about June 2020, three years ago. And if you look at what had happened prior to that, this is what the bears were barking about. And I remember this double top. And this waiting is mainly Amazon and Tesla into a one, two nested bear down that was going to take us to uh, even lower lows. And what happened off that? Now, there was a test after that bull cross. It sets the higher low, and then we all know the rest of the story. And you wanted to be into big tech well into 2021. We've got the same setup here. Possible double topping look right here. Some people are going to say, oh, it's a head and, head and shoulders, left head, right. Here we're lower. And you know, what if not? What if we double just like we did? What if we double right into this target? And the possibility is there. And I do not want to be of a mindset to miss it. This to me looks like a channel about ready to run and get filled. Okay, so now let's get into some individual names. And I'll just start with the one staring right at me here on the screen. A lot of questions this week following... NVIDIA's move um, ab about other names in the space. And so Adobe was one that came up and, and you're going to see really similar counts here on a lot of these names that I think we set leading diagonal one into two, a pretty clear impulse up into one into two. And now look at that rocket shot. So we're now into that minor three zone. Again, surprises can be to the upside and we've got two massive gaps to fill all the way through this FIB zone, all the way up to 440, then I think we'll get some rest in June. Okay, again, where am I going to be wrong? It's really clear. You can't have this four trade into this one. So if Adobe reverses hard next week, you're likely going to see the entire semiconductor space reverse hard. NVIDIA is going to give back a, a bunch of its earnings. AMD is going to move back. You've got your level right here at 384 on a name like Adobe, you're going to see a similar look on AMD. So we've got a one, two, one, two, three, four. Now, because this move was so massive, there's a ton of give back room here on AMD. But if this three is done, I would just project it probably comes back to touch the start of the Thursday sympathy move from NVIDIA. That's where this FIB zone is. There would be no reason to sound the alarm until the May 10 high would be broken. But again, surprises can be to the upside. And you can see moving all the way through up into that FIB zone, we're carrying it back all the way into the early 2022 time period. Okay, let's keep marching through some individual names here. So let me get you over into Tesla. And man, have I been trolled 
on this. Uh, there were so many people that said, let me get you here into that so we can see that gap fill. Uh, that Tesla uh, would never fill this earnings gap down. And look at what we did. We set that 0.618 and we filled it and we've blown right up here into that potential area right at the 200 day in this key pivot. And we're there knocking on the door of that key $200 psych level. And if it, if it recaptures, and I'm going to use Microsoft's 300 level as a similar um, analogy here, I don't think it's going to give it back. And, and you think I'm going to get an apology from those trolls? Well, no, certainly not. They'll just delete their tweets. But this is the count that would have Art K moving up aggressively given Tesla's waiting. Okay, so if I show you that into the short term, and I do want to show you that because I had called out this name in the Discord group right in here, just show you that again, right here, given you say, and I said on Friday, if there's three names that you want to play individually today, it is Tesla, it is Amazon, and it is Netflix. And look at that move up. Now you had to be smart. You had to know that you needed to take profits, especially on a Friday lotto, all the way back below that key 200 psych level was where you wanted to take those profits. Okay. Let me get you now into Netflix because that was a phenomenal move. And I had showed this chart on Thursday. Um, and on Thursday, I had said it was right in here. If we get any kind of higher low opportunity against this, that this is a buy. And your invalidation level was simply the previous low of the week. And look at where it shot right from here all the way up. About 30 bucks. Incredible move there on Netflix. And I just have it one, two, three, four. And I think, man, you get 373 to hold. There is another buy opportunity to get it up into those minor three fib zones that I have shown you here on multiple charts. So just phenomenal. Okay, of course, everyone's going to want to know uh, about NVIDIA. And simply what happened was wave three extended. And could wave three keep going up to this higher fib? Absolutely. 400 there going to be the next key psych, psych level uh, that, that stopped it. Uh, now, again, could we see like what I talked about with Adobe? Could we see this actually pull back? Certainly. And there will at some point be a wave four pullback, but it's like everything else that I've just shown you, uh, Netflix included. What if three isn't done? And here we just keep moving higher through these fib zones before we actually get that pullback. And that's actually uh, what I'm leaning towards happening. Okay, a few other key individual charts that I know everyone wants to talk about. Um, and so we should talk about Microsoft because Microsoft in response, rightly so, to NVIDIA, uh, just up strongly and then right into that minor three fib zone again. This is a theme. Can we extend? For sure. Could we, could we pull back? For sure. It's all right there and we just have to wait and see what's going to happen. Take a look at a name like Goog. I showed you that on the short term. We're now up and out of this potential channel. It put an acceleration channel in place. We have higher fibs though that are waiting. I showed you that on the 15 minute chart. Same with Amazon here. We had a key gap fill just below 121. My call would be that at least the next one fills before we see a more significant, uh, maybe multi-day pullback here on Amazon. This is one really high on my list that if it establishes here some strength above that gapping area, I think we can run quickly early next week into the mid to upper 125s. Okay, and of course, we've got to talk about Apple. And, and should we be concerned here about the Apple chart? Look at this bull stack of MAs. Look at this minor three zone yet to fill. That just comes right off the December low into the March low, and it hasn't yet reached it. So when I'm talking about there's still a, a move out there yet on the queues, we look right here. It hasn't yet reached that level. And we can show you here on the weekly, nothing concerning at all here from a bearish perspective on the weekly. And, and, and what is it? How, how many dollars is it away? $6, $7 from an all-time high when NVIDIA has already made it and Microsoft is only a few percent away. This is not bearish 
in its looks at all. Okay, that takes you through some great individual names all across the board. I do want to finish up making this comprehensive here. Uh, what looks really bad? And I think it's oil. Here's XLE, oil and energy. Look, look at this. You have exactly the opposite look with structure and MAs here on XLE. And so I'm kind of suggesting here that this inflation energy trade, that, that really was the trade at the kickoff of the bear market in 2022, is now going to reverse. And so, you know, we'll, we'll see here. I'm kind of excited to see if this turns out because I think if you want to short something, don't short the general stock market, short energy. Look, look at this right here. This is a very bearish configuration. So if, if you want to take an idea here on where to short, I think XLE has a lot of meat on the bone here as a short candidate uh, for much of the rest of the year. Okay, something else that I don't think looks that great is metals and miners. So let's get in here to the GLD daily and look at this. We've just got a waterfall down look here. We've got MA starting to bear crossover. And if I show you a higher time frame, the weekly doesn't look nearly as bad as XLE. Uh, but I think, I think we're going to see metals pull back even more. See if we can get this chart to pop back up here. Wanted you to see this pullback zone here on the weekly. And if it won't, I'll just have to take you back to the daily. This, I think, one, two. Now, that doesn't mean that I am, for the long term, bearish on gold. I just think in the short term that we'll see that rotation. Uh, you know, the fear trade here, safety trade on gold, I think at least in the short to intermediate term, I'm actually not bullish on that. And I get you into a name here like GDX, and I've got to keep a very bearish count here on the table you know, if inflation fears subside, if interest rates, uh, if they pull back, um, if we see money rotate through the general stock market, there's no guarantee that this can't happen. Otherwise, we do have a very bullish one too. So this is probably the sector that I'm the most uncertain about it would, would be the metals and the miners. Um, because is this a bullish nest? Well, I don't know. It hit that 0.618 fib. Was this a three-wave bear bounce? And at this point, I've got to keep that on the chart because I don't think I can rule it out. Okay, so that takes you through some just some interesting things that I wanted to show you elsewhere. Let's finish up with crypto. And so we're looking here at the Bitcoin weekly chart. And I wouldn't say bearish. It has not yet broken out bullishly. That occurs in the mid-27s. Let's keep watching crypto these next couple days, this holiday weekend, to see if we get any clues here. Is this a 1-2-1-2? And I think a potential just for a massive bull flag. And you're going to see that on XRP as well. It's possible XRP is in the process of breaking that out. A real breakout level on Bitcoin is this 50 SMA, about 28.2. So that's going to break the flag, break that MA, and then we could get a general risk on sentiment here in risk assets. Let's get into XRP, and I want to show you that potentially massive bull flag here trying to break in a three count. It's working on it. It's working hard against a back test and this key 50-day SMA, and I think this is the breakout zone. 50 cents, you're going to see it on the weekly, is a really key pivot here. Right there, that's the 50 cent pivot. That's the 200 week SMA. That's a long term pivot. Magnet point shoots up, shoots back to it, shoots up, pulls back, goes up, pulls back, breaks it, goes back. It is a magnet there. This is the real breakout level, is 50 cents, where you want to take a chance that maybe XRP has a very, very surprising bull run left in it. Okay, want to finish with Ethereum here because this had gotten quite a few questions. And this honestly is one name in the crypto space I'm not quite as bullish on. And I would imagine that if it goes down, the others go with it. Because this look here, 
from May 12 into May 23rd. That to me does not look very bullish. That doesn't look impulsive. So possible that this is a double zigzag and we've got A into a B down to finish this minor four. So I'm a little bit more cautious here on crypto in the general space because of this ETH count. But again, just something here to project and something to, to be uh, interested in looking at over the next week. Okay, so that was long, but I, I know it was overdue and there was lots that I wanted you to look at. Um, and so let me just do two things to wrap it up. Let me show you that SPY short-term trading chart where I think we just held right on that key 420 pivot. Do we move up? If we do, we've got lots of gaps all the way up to 428. If it's bearish, and we'll know that in ES, and we lose 41.75 ES, and then we eventually lose this Thursday high at 416, that's when we need to be cautious against um, aggressive bull counts. But again, let me just show you and finish here with that highest time frame chart that this is really, when I'm in doubt, come back to the high time frames. And this look is not the same. And so I'm excited about what we've got going on and excited about what I am now opening up um, a free public community in my Discord. Come join us at Pikes Peak Trades in our Discord community. We had a rocking day on Friday and I'm super excited for the summer months to give you some other things to get involved, um, some education, some ideas, some learning, um, some good community and really excited where I think things could go in the market. So want to wish you a wonderful holiday weekend. Make sure you get outside. Make sure you enjoy friends and family. Don't stare at charts all the time. And we're going to see what happens when futures open Monday into Tuesday. It is going to be exciting. I think we're in for a pretty exciting time here for the next couple of weeks.